that I was not able to do within the time constraints in the previous lecture. Uh, you know, if you say to Roman Catholics that their church demands worship, they will tell you, well, uh, we, we don't demand worship. We don't claim that the Roman Catholic Church is God. And my answer is simply that the Roman Catholic Church claims the prerogatives of God. It doesn't have to say we are God, but by claiming the prerogatives of God, that's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church is saying. Let me give you the evidence, the clear evidence, that the Roman Catholic Church and the popes in particular and the priesthood claim to be God. Number one, in the Bible, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, the man of sin, which is a prophecy about the papacy, it says that the man of sin sits in the temple of God. Do you know what the temple of God is? It's the church. You know, you can, you can get that. Every time the Apostle Paul uses the expression temple of God, the naos of God, it refers to the church. So it says that the man of sin sits, man of sin sits in the temple of God, claiming to be what? Claiming to be God. So if the man of sin is the papacy, and we dealt with that yesterday, then we find clearly that he sits in the church and he claims to be God. And if he claims to be God, would he claim uh, the, the right to be worshipped? Absolutely. Now let me give you additional evidence. Pope Leo XIII, in um, an encyclical letter, June 20, 1894, said this, speaking about the popes, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Furthermore, the Pope allows himself to be called the Holy Father. Jesus said, call no man your father on earth, for there is one Father which is your God in heaven. So if he claims to be called Holy Father, is he claiming the prerogatives of God? He sure is. By the way, that text is Matthew 23, verse 9. Furthermore, the Pope allows people to bow before him. Peter, who supposedly was the first Pope, when Cornelius came and Cornelius bowed before him, what did Peter do? He says, get up from there. I am a man just like you are. That's found in Acts 10, 25, and 26. So if the Pope allows people to bow before him, is he claiming the prerogatives of God? Yes, yes he is. Furthermore, does the papacy claim to have power to forgive sins? Who only can forgive sins? God. Does the papacy claim to have changed God's law? God's day of worship? Who could only do that? God. So is it claiming the prerogatives of God? Yes. Does the papacy claim since 1870 to be infallible when the Pope speaks on faith and morals, ex cathedra. Yes, but who only is infallible? God. Has the papacy claimed during the 1260 years that it has the right to set up kings and remove kings? The book of Daniel chapter 2 says that it is God who sets up kings and removes kings. Did the papacy claim that it had the right to judge everyone and that the pope could be judged by no one? Gregory the seventh, Pope Gregory the seventh said that. But the Bible tells me that the judge is whom? Is God. Perhaps the biggest blasphemy that shows that the papacy claims the prerogatives of God, and therefore it claims worship, whether it says it, it does or not, but it does by all these characteristics, is in the sacrifice of the Mass. This is where you have particular blasphemous statement and this is at the end of your syllabus you know the Roman Catholic Church believes that when the priest pronounces the words hoc est corpus meum this is my body that the the host is no longer a host even though it appears to be it tastes the same as a host but it is a real body and flesh of Jesus Christ in other words the priest has transformed the host into the real body of Christ let me read you a statement from St. Alphonsus Liguori, one of the doctors of the Roman Catholic Church. There's 30-some doctors in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, the great men like Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine and St. Bernard and, and others 
uh, uh, that, uh, you know, St. Alphonsus Liguori is one of those. And uh, he wrote a book uh, which is very interesting. The name of the book is The Dignity and Duties of the Priest or Selva, where, where he, he got together all of the traditions in the Roman Catholic Church from early in the history of the church about the authority and the power of the priest. And I'm going to read you just one statement. There are many others that I could read you that shows that the papacy does claim the power and prerogatives of God. And so it is claiming worship whether it says it does or not. So when the third angel's message says if anybody worships the beast, it's talking about worshiping the Roman Catholic system because they claim to have the prerogatives of God. Listen to this statement. Thus the priest may in a certain manner be called the creator of his creator, since by saying the words of consecration, he creates, as it were, Jesus in the sacrament by giving him a sacramental existence and produces him as a victim to be offered to the Eternal Father. As in creating the world, it was sufficient for God to have said, let it be made, and it was created. He spoke, and they were made. So it is sufficient for the priest to say, hoc est corpus meum, that is, this is my body, and behold, the bread is no longer bread, but the body of Jesus Christ. The power of the priest, says St. Bernardine of Siena, is the power of the divine person. For the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. I rest my case. This is a system that claims the powers and prerogatives of God and claims the worship of human beings, whether they want to admit it or not. So when the third angel's message says, whoever worships the beast, it's saying whoever worships the Roman Catholic system that claims to occupy the place of God on earth and to perform the power and the prerogatives of God. Is that clear? Yes. Now let's go to page 269 in our syllabus, uh, Reflections on Daniel 11. And uh, this session and next session, uh, we will be engaged in studying Daniel 11, and then uh, I'm hoping that by this afternoon we will be able to enter our study of Revelation 17, which Revelation 17 and Daniel 11 and Daniel 7 and Revelation 12 and 13, they're all interconnected. Now, let's, uh, let's go through this material like we have in previous sessions. Um, it's written the way that I want it to come out, so we'll just follow what the syllabus has. There is a passage in the book of Daniel that has caused a lively discussion among Seventh-day Adventist ministers and theologians, and that is Daniel 11, verses 40 through 45. Until recently, the Seventh-day Adventist church practically unanimously believed that the king of the north was a symbol of the papacy and that the king of the south was a symbol of secularism primarily reflected in the attitude of the French Revolution. But recently a new view has appeared on the scene. And that is the idea that yes, the king of the north is the papacy, but the king of the south is radical Islam. And the reason why uh, this new interpretation has been brought forth is because Radical Islam is in the news since 9-11 and the rise of Al-Qaeda and the rise of ISIS. You know, there's unrest among the theologians. They say, well, all of these things have to be someplace in Bible prophecy. And so what they do is they go from what is happening to Scripture and they reapply some of the things that the Adventist church has already defined what they mean. Usually, Ellen White provides valuable guidance in the interpretation of difficult passages of Scripture. But Ellen White seems to be silent on Daniel 11, verses 40 through 45. And some people have taken this apparent silence by Ellen White on these verses to think that perhaps Ellen White simply did not have all of the light 
but that those that are teaching radical Islam today, they now have all of the light. In other words, they are going beyond what God revealed to Ellen G. White. Now, first of all, we want to ask the question, does Ellen White have anything to say about Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45? If you examine her writings, you will find that she never quotes these verses. Even more complicated, she never even alludes to the language that is found in these verses. So our task is very complicated to try and find out what Ellen White had to say about Daniel 11, 40 to 45 when she never quotes the verses and she never even alludes to the language in the verses. So you're saying, how in the world can we ever, ever determine if Ellen White had anything to say about these verses? We are going to discover that Ellen White had a lot to say about these verses. Even though she does not quote them, and she does not allude to the language. And we're going to find there's a reason why she did not quote these verses or allude to the language. There's a historical reason. Now, at the bottom of the page, Ellen White's use of Daniel 11. To my knowledge, there are only three primary Ellen White references to Daniel 11. And one of these is indirect, another one is general, and then there is only one in all of her writing, writings that is very specific. So once again, one of these quotations is indirect. She doesn't actually say Daniel 11. Another one, she mentions Daniel 11, but it's a very general reference. And the third one is a very specific reference to Daniel 11 where she actually quotes verses. Not verses 40 to 45, but verses 30 through 36. Now let's examine these three Ellen G. White quotations. The first quotation is indirect. Because she does not specifically mention Daniel 11, but only alludes to it. In 1896, Ellen White wrote this. The light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days. The visions he saw by the banks of the Ulai. Which vision did Daniel receive by the Ulai? Daniel 8. Okay? So is she alluding to Daniel 8 here? Yes. The visions that he saw by the banks of the Ulai and the Heidekel. Which vision did he receive by the Heidekel? Daniel 10, 11, and 12. So she's connecting what? Daniel 8 with Daniel 11. Are you following me or not? Very important point. And by the way, Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 follow the same sequence of events. Daniel 8 begins with Medo-Persia and Daniel 11 begins with, Medo with Persia. Daniel uh, 8 continues with Greece and Daniel 11 continues with Greece. Daniel 8 has a notable king and Daniel 11 has a notable king. Daniel 11 has four divisions after that. Daniel 11 has four divisions after that. And then you have the breaking of the Prince of the Covenant uh, in the middle of Daniel 11. And then you have the papacy during 1260 years, just like you have in Daniel 8, the little horn. And then you have the final crisis. Daniel 11 is a, an expansion of Daniel 8. Are you with me? That's why Ellen White here speaks about the, the visions that he saw by the Ulai and by the Heidekel. In this way, Ellen White is saying that Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 need to be studied together. So is Ellen White alluding to Daniel 11 indirectly? Yeah, because she mentions the visions next to the Heidekel, and those were given in Daniel 10 and 11. Now the second quotation is general and was written in 1909. Here she actually mentions the phrase Daniel 11. This is the quotation. By the way, the previous one was from Testimonies to Ministers, page 112. And this one is in Nine Testimonies, page 14. It reads in the following way. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. 
the prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel, see she mentions the 11th chapter, right? The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. So where are we in Daniel 11? Are we at the beginning of Daniel 11? The middle of Daniel 11? No, 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 towards the end. She says, uh, once again, the prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly, nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. She's referring to the time of trouble in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the third quotation was written in 1904. And it is the only one where Ellen White actually quotes verses from Daniel 11. Uh, this is found in manuscript releases, volume 13 and page 394. And this is a very important statement. It's only one in all of the writings of Ellen White where she actually quotes Daniel 11. This is how it reads. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy of the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. And now she makes a very interesting remark. Much of the history that has taken place in the fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. Are you following me or not? Much of the history of Daniel 11 is going to be repeated. Not the prophecy of Daniel 11. The prophecy of Daniel 11 does not have a dual fulfillment. It is the history that fulfilled the prophecy that is going to be repeated in similar fashion. So she says the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in the fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. And then she's going to quote the verses that will be repeated. Uh, not not, the, not the, the prophecy, but the events of the history. She says, in the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And then she continues quoting verses 31 to 36. I didn't put it in the quotation to uh, save space. And then she repeats the same thought again. She has said much of the history that has taken place in the fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. And then at the end of the statement she says something similar. She says scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. Are you with me? Now let's analyze these three quotations. The quotation from Testimonies to Ministers, page 112, provides us two key items of information. First, the prophecies of Daniel 8 and 11 run concurrently and are parallel. Is that clear? The prophecy by the Uli was the one given in chapter 8, and the one by the Heidekel was the one given in chapters 10 and 11. So, Chapter 8 and chapter 11 must be studied together because they run the same sequence of events. They are parallel. Now the second statement uh, tells us that both of these prophecies were in the process of what? Of fulfillment when Ellen White wrote in 1896. Unfortunately, Ellen White does not specify in this particular statement how much of the chapter had already been fulfilled when she wrote the statement. She merely stated that these prophecies were in the process of fulfillment, right? So she's saying, you know, some of Daniel 11 has been fulfilled because it's in the process of fulfillment in 1896. But the third quotation is very significant because the third quotation uh, tells us some specific things that we don't find in the other quotations. Uh, Let's, let's notice uh, at the top of the page, the quotation in Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 14, adds some very valuable information. When Ellen White wrote this testimony, 
in 1909 she stated that the prophecy of Daniel 11 had what? Had nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Thus we can be certain that in 1909 the process of fulfillment of Daniel 11 was where? Was in the last few verses of the chapter. The quotation from Manuscript Releases, volume 13, page 394, contains some significant information that is not found in the other two. In this statement, Ellen White explains that much of the history that has taken place in the fulfillment of this chapter will be what? Will be repeated. The critical question then is this, which history was she referring to when she says much of the history of Daniel 11 is going to be repeated in the future? Which history was she referring to? We don't have to guess. It's the history that is described in what verses? In verses 30 to 36. Because immediately after saying that much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated, she then quotes verses 30 to 36. Are you following me or not? Very, very important. Clearly, Ellen White understood that verses 30 to 36, as well as we'll find verses 37 to 39, which she does not quote, had already been fulfilled in the past when she wrote. If verses 30 to 39 had already been fulfilled in the past when Ellen White wrote, then the similar future scenes that she spoke about must be fulfilled where? In verses 40 to 45. Are you understanding my point? She says much of the history of this chapter has already been fulfilled when she wrote in 1909. And then she quotes verses 30 to 36. And we could add verses 37 to 39 because it's describing the same period. So for her, had verses 30 uh, through 39 already been fulfilled in the past? Which scenes were going to be similar in the future? The ones that are contained in these verses. So where would you find the future uh, repetition of the history that you find in these verses? Well, what do you have less left in Daniel 11? All you have left is verses 40 to 45. So the future repetition of the history of verses 30 through 39 has to be where? In verses 40 through 45. Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. I hope that those who did not raise their hand are simply lazy. <laughs> now, let's continue here. I'm going to read the paragraph so you get it clearly. Clearly, Ellen White understood that verses 30 to 36, as well as verses 37 to 39, which she does not quote, had already been fulfilled in the past. When she wrote, if verses 30 to 39 had already been fulfilled in the past, then the similar future scenes must be described in verses 40 to 45. Thus, verses 30 to 39 describe events in the past from the time that Ellen White wrote, while verses 40 to 45 describe events when? in the future. Now here's a very important paragraph. It is important to realize that Ellen White is not saying that these verses have a dual fulfillment. In other words, these verses are not going to be fulfilled again. What is going to take place is that many of the, many of the things that fulfilled these verses will be repeated. The his history, what happened in the history of this prophecy, many of the scenes are going to be similarly repeated. Are you understanding the distinction? Very important. What she is saying is that much of the history that fulfilled these verses will be repeated. Stated another way, it is not the prophecy of verses 30 to 39 that will be fulfilled once again, but rather much of the history that fulfilled the prophecy in the past that will be repeated in similar fashion in the future. Now we need to uh, take a look at the distinction between a double fulfillment of the prophecy and a similar fulfillment to the history. That takes us to our next paragraph. At this juncture in our study, we need to ask, why will the historical scenes of the past repeat once again in similar fashion? 
the answer really isn't hard to find. The arrogant, and we've studied this before, the arrogant and persecuting power that is described in verses 30 to 39 is the Roman Catholic Papacy, as it behaved during its 1260 year career. That's why it's passed. During this period, as we've studied, it joined church and state, ran loose, in other words it was not in captivity, and used the sword of the state to persecute dissenters. That's verses 30 to 39. Are you catching my gist? Verses 30 to 39. As is well known, at the end of the 1260 years the papacy received what? A deadly wound. When the state turned against it in the events related to the French Revolution. But this was not the end of the papacy's career. Right? We studied this. Prophecy predicts that after a period of convalescence the deadly wound will be what? Healed. When the United States will return the sword of civil power into the papacy's hand. Then the papacy will what? Will once more behave as it did in the past. Is that the repetition of the history? Not the prophecy, the what? Much of the history because it's the same system. Thus the history of the past papal oppression will be repeated in the future because the papacy will rise once again to power. In summary, Ellen White believed that Daniel 11, 30-36 was fulfilled in the past, and of course verses 37-39 to also. She also believed that much of the history described in these verses would be repeated in similar fashion if verses 30 to 39 had already been fulfilled in the past in Ellen White's day in 1909, then the future repetition of history of these verses must be found where? In verses 40 to 45. See, this is like detective work. <laughs> you know, people say I would have made a good lawyer or a good detective. I'm glad I became a preacher. <laughs> Now notice Ellen White understood these two stages of the papacy, past and future. Uh, we've read these statements before, but let me just read once again because this is important to what we're discussing. Great Controversy 579, the influence of Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed. And prophecy foretells what? A restoration of her power. And then she quotes Revelation 13, 3, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Is the papacy going to, be going to behave in the future like it behaved in the past? Will there be similar scenes? Will history be repeated? Yes, absolutely. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 712. When our nation, that is the United States, shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestantism will in this act join hands with popery. It will be nothing else than what? That's an important expression, giving life. Why would the papacy need to be, be given life? Because it has a deadly wound. Giving life to the tyranny which has long been eagerly watching its opportunity to what? To spring again into what? Active despotism. So is the papacy going to behave in the future like it behaved in the past? Is there going to be a repetition of the history of this period in similar fashion? Yes. So had verses 30 to 39 been fulfilled already in, the, in 1909? Yes. Now the third quotation, uh, you'll notice the, sub, the, the underlined portions, uh, the Bible, uh, Ellen White tells us that uh, Protestants will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, reviving, notice the terminology, give life and vigor, because it lost its life and vigor through the deadly wound. And, and she says, reviving what? Her tyranny and oppression of conscience. So once again, the idea that the past history of this system is going to be what? Repeated. Now let's go to our next section. 
But does Ellen White have anything to say about the events that are described in verses 40 to 45? She quotes verses 30 to 36. We know that these are past. But does she have anything to say about verses 40 to 45? The question is, where would we even begin to look? Because she never quotes these verses. And she never even alludes to the terminology that we find in these verses. So where would we even look in the writings of Ellen White to see where she comments on these verses? Several years ago, I found what I believe to be the key that unlocks her concept of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, even though she does not quote the verses or use the terminology. Let's go to the next paragraph or the next sentence. I believe that the key that will unlock her understanding of these verses is found in her understanding of Daniel 12, verse 1. Is that the verse that comes immediately after verse 45? Yeah. Though Ellen White never quoted or even alluded to the language of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 in the book, The Great Controversy, she did quote the next verse, Daniel 12, verse 1. I believe that the place where she quotes Daniel 12, verse 1, contains the key that unlocks her understanding of the immediately preceding verses. Are you catching the, the, the way that we're going to... See, we're going to work deductively. Do you know, uh, uh, detectives work deductively. You know, they look for all of the clues, and then they work backwards to the crime. Well, there's no crime here. Understand. <laughs> But you're going to look at all the clues uh, that are there to, in the writings of Ellen to, to find out, you know, where she comments about verses 40 to 45. Now, let's work deductively. Because Ellen White did not quote or even allude to the terminology of verses 40 to 45 in the Great Controversy, we cannot work from verse 40 forwards, right? Because we don't know where her comments on verse 40, verse 40 are found. What we must do then is work deductively from Daniel 12, 1 and 2 backwards. How many of you are understanding what I'm saying? So let's take a look at Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. Four points here. At that time, Michael shall stand up. That's a close of probation, by the way. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be, after Michael stands up, what, the, what is there going to be? There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. So you have Michael standing up, the time of trouble, and then what? And at that time, that is in the time of trouble, your people shall be what? Delivered. That's the next event. At the end of the time of trouble, God's people are delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And now notice Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This is when God's people are delivered, right? Every, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Do you have that sequence clear? The sequence is the standing up of Michael, the time of trouble, the deliverance of God's people from the time of trouble, and the special resurrection, or the resurrection of, of some, many, who lie in the dust of the earth, will rise. Some to everlasting life, and some to um, shame and everlasting contempt. Now, let's notice how Ellen White developed these four events in great controversy, but in reverse order. Is that fair? Reverse. So we're going to work from Daniel 12, verse 2, backwards. This is where it gets very interesting. Great Controversy 637. Comments on the special resurrection. Remember the page, page 637. This is how Ellen White comments on it. She's commenting on the fourth item, on the special resurrection. Graves are opened. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Is that a quotation of Daniel 12, verse 2? So we know in Great Controversy where she's commenting on item number 4. Now where, where does she comment on item number 3? 
which is the deliverance of God's people. On page 635, we're going backwards, right? On page 635, Ellen White describes a third item on the list. The chapter's title is what? God's people delivered. Is that the third item on the list? Absolutely. At the beginning of the chapter, she states, the people of God, some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats in the forest and the mountains, still plead for divine protection while in every quarter companies of armed men urged on by hosts of evil angels are preparing for the work of death. It is now in the hour of utmost extremity that the God of Israel will interpose for the deliverance of His saints. Is that the third item on the list? They were working backwards. Now, it will be noticed also that Ellen White concluded the previous chapter on the time of trouble, which is at the end of the time of trouble. Notice the quotation that she gives right before the chapter on God's people delivered. In the last paragraph, she once again says God is going to deliver His people. It says there in Great Controversy 634, Glorious will be the what? The deliverance of those who have patiently waited for His coming and whose what? Whose names are written in the book of life. Is that in Daniel 12 verse 2? It most certainly is. Now we need to go, that's item number three. Now we need to see where Ellen White comments on item number two, the time of trouble. Would you expect to find it earlier in Great Controversy? Yes. Notice Great Controversy page 616. We have the second item in the list. Here Ellen White begins the chapter on the time of trouble. In fact, the title of the chapter before the deliverance of God's people is the time of trouble. So is she commenting on item number two in this chapter? Of course. She actually uses the expression, she says, the people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. That's item number two, and it's page 616. So we move from page 637 to 635 to 616. Where would you expect to find the standing up of Michael in the close of probation? How about page 613? Do you know how she, what verse she begins uh, the chapter with? Daniel 12, verse 1. <laughs> and then she makes this comment. Then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. When he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Is that the close of probation? So, summary of Ellen White's exposition of Daniel 12, 1 and 2. 613, the standing up of Michael. 616, the time of trouble. 635, God's people delivered. 637, the special resurrection. And I put them in forward order, but we studied them in backward order. Now let's take a look at the important expression at that time. It is extremely important to realize that Daniel 12 verses 1 and 2 cannot be understood independently of its context. Daniel 12 1 and 2 is actually a continuation of the flow of events that transpired in the previous verses. Are you understanding that point? Yeah. Crucially important. In other words, Daniel 12 and 1 and 2 does not begin a new sequence, it continues the sequence of the previous chapter. And you say, how do we know that? Well, this is clearly indicated by the fact that Daniel 12 verse 1 begins with a time reference. At that time. The question is, at which time? At the time when the king of the north, in verses 45, 40 and 45, 44 and 45, are coming after God's people to what? To destroy them. That's why Michael has to stand up and watch guard over God's people. Because the king of the north is coming after them. Let me ask you, what would the king of the north represent? Who utters the death decree in the book of Revelation? 
It's the beast that rises from the earth, by, but by the commissioning of whom? Of the papacy. So would this be the same scenario? Who would, be the, who would the king of the north be? It would have to be the papacy. You can only have one last power that persecutes God's people, not 20. If the last power in Revelation 13 is the papacy, by the help of the United States, if it's the same power in 2 Thessalonians 2, in Matthew 24, in Revelation 17, this must represent the same power that goes out, gives the death decree against God's people. So the expression at that time connects with chapter 11. Now here is the key question. Where would we expect to find Ellen White's comments about what takes place before Daniel 12 verse 1? I'll give you one guess. <laughs> How about before page 613? Does that sound reasonable? We can't always depend on reason, so we have to look at the evidence. Now let's consider the literary structure of Daniel 11, 44b through verse 45, and then chapter 12 and verse 1. And we're going to go to uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 44a in a little while. I'm leaving it out for a specific reason. Now let's carefully consider the literary structure of Daniel 11, 44, the last half of the verse, and verse 45, as it relates to Daniel 12, verse 1. In order to ascertain to what event the expression at that time refers to, a comparison of these two passages reveals that they are describing the same events in the same order, but with different terminology and emphasis. So in other words, what I'm saying is that Daniel 11, 44, the last half of the verse, and verse 45 present the same order of events as Daniel 12 and verse 1, but with a different emphasis. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, let's carefully then consider the structure, the literary structure of Daniel 11, 44b and 45 with Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Let's examine first of all, first of all Daniel 11, 44, the last half of the verse and verse 45. I'm summarizing here, verse 44b says the king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate many. Okay, so the king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate many. Second event in verse 45a, the king of the north sets up the tents of his palace in a strategic place between the sea and the glorious holy mountain to give a final death blow to God's people. And then C, which is Daniel 11, 45b, the king of the north, what? Comes to his end with none to help him. So are you catching the picture? The picture is the king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate many. It sets itself up in a strategic location to deliver the final death blow, and then the king of the north comes to his end with no one to help him. Now Daniel 12 verse 1 repeats the same three ideas in the exact order, but with a different emphasis. Daniel 12 verse 1 says, Michael stands up to what? <laughs> to defend his people when the king of the north goes out to destroy them. Are you with me? What comes as a result of the king of the north placing himself in a strategic position to uh, deliver the death blow? God's people will go through what? Through the time of trouble. But what's going to happen with the king of the north? He's going to come to the end with none to help him. Daniel 12 verse 1 says that God's people will be delivered. Are you following me? Now let's, let's read this here from the syllabus. Daniel 11, 44b and 45 and 12, 1 are precisely parallel, but they portray a different emphasis. 
Whereas Daniel 11, 44b through verse 45 highlights the activities of the king of the north, isn't that the center of, of, of that passage there? And its destiny for oppressing God's people, Daniel 12, verse 1, focus on the jeopardy of God's people at the hand of the king of the north and their deliverance by God. This is the way it works out. When the king of the north goes out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many, Michael will stand up to protect and defend them. When the king of the north places the tents of his palace in a strategic location to deliver the final death blow against God's people, by the way, vividly described in the first page of God's people delivered in great controversy, God's people will go through a terrible time of trouble such as never was. But the king of the north will come to his end with none to help him when God intervenes to deliver his people who are written in the book. Thus the expression at th that time links Daniel 11, 44b and verse 45 with Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. The actions of the king of the north against the remnant are answered by counteractions by God in defense of his faithful remnant. Did you catch the point? Isn't this fun? <laughs> I delight in the study of Scripture. It's beautiful. No human mind could have devised this. I mean, this, this is evidence of the Bible's inspiration, as far as I'm concerned. Now you say, now wait a minute, Pastor Bohr, what about the first part of verse 44 that you skipped? Ah, we need to take a look at that. So let's go to our next subtitle, what about Daniel 11:44a? Here we are told that tidings from the north and from the east will trouble the king of the north. In other words, this phrase explains the reason why the king of the north will go out and attempt to destroy and annihilate many. Are you understanding this? In other words, the first half of verse 44 says that Tidings from the north and the east are going to trouble the king of the north. And because they trouble him, what is he going to do? He's going to go out to try and annihilate and destroy God's people, which will lead to Michael standing up to defend them, which will lead eventually to their deliverance. Let's read the verse. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. That means alarm or disturb him. And what does he do then? Therefore, what does therefore indicate? Because of this, therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. Do the tidings from the north and the east have anything to do with the anger of the king of the north against God's people? Absolutely, it's the reason. Now what is this news that comes from the east and from the north that so infuriates the king of the north that he seeks to destroy many. We must go to the book of Revelation to answer this question because the book of Revelation unseals the book of Daniel. It, it is the secrets unsealed of Daniel. <laughs> Notice the book Christ Triumphant, page 344. The books of Daniel and the Revelation are one. One is a prophecy, the other is a revelation, which means unveiling, by the way. The, book, the word revelation, apocalypsis, means that something is unveiled or unsealed. One book is sealed, the other is a book what? Open. Now, what are these tidings from the east and the north? Well, here's something very interesting. Is there any place in the book of Revelation where you have an angel coming with the, from the east to do something with God's people? Revelation chapter 7. There is a mighty angel that descends having the seal of God to seal the servants of God on their foreheads. Is this going to infuriate the beast who has a mark and is very unhappy about certain people receiving God's seal? Absolutely. So it is this, this angel that comes from the east, it says, for the sealing that will infuriate the beast because people are not receiving the mark of the beast. They are receiving what? The seal of God. 
Now you say, what about the north? What are the tidings from the north? In Revelation chapter 18, we have a mighty angel that descends from where? From heaven. Heaven is north, in case you were wondering. You say, really? Heaven is north? Of course. What did Lucifer say in heaven, in Isaiah chapter 14? He says, I will go to the sides of the what? Of the north, and I will sit in the place of the Almighty. God's throne is in the north. By the way, that's the reason why Psalm 48 verses 1 and 2 says that Jerusalem on the sides of the north is the city of the great king. The new Jerusalem is the city of the great king, and it is in the sides of the north. So this mighty angel that descends from heaven, that proclaims a loud cry, get out of Babylon, oh, Babylon's going to be really happy about that message, isn't it? Is the harlot going to be furious when God's people denounce the abominations that are being committed? Is Babylon going to be filled with rage? Yes. So the king of the north is filled with rage because of the sealing message, which is a contradiction of the mark of the beast, and because God's people are proclaiming the loud cry for people to get out of Babylon, and multitudes are coming out of Babylon, and Babylon is losing its subjects. Are you with me? Of course, Ellen White already knew this. You know, people who are critical of Ellen White, they just don't study like this. You know, they nitpick. They say, you know, Ellen White got wrong the number of rooms in the sanitarium. So what? God did not reveal to Ellen White the number of rooms of the sanitarium. The key point was that somebody was hiding in the closet. She was hiding in the closet, and she heard Dr. Kellogg overcharging the rich so that he could provide free service to the poor. I guess he might have been a socialist. <laughs> that uh, was... I should not have made that political remark. <laughs> anyway, back to our material here. Notice Ellen White understood that the loud cry and the sealing was going to lead the, the power of the earth, the papacy, to have rage against God's people. Notice Great Controversy, page 605. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. Uh, I, I'm wondering, do you, do you know what title the chapter is before the chapter on the time of trouble? The final warning. Interesting. Is that the tidings from the north and from the east? The final warning? She actually begins by quoting Revelation 18, 1 to 4. Interesting. So does Ellen White have anything to say about uh, verses 44 and 45? Oh, yeah, she does. Absolutely. Now, she also, in that same chapter on the final warning, she speaks about the sealing, right? We just read the, 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 the verse on the first page of that chapter. Some receive the mark of the beast, others receive the seal of God. Then on page 607, she says, the power attending the message will only what? Madden those who oppose it. There you have the anger. And then on pages 614 and 615 in the same chapter, she says, the power attending the last warning, actually this is on the chapter of the time of trouble, but she's referring to back to what happened during the sealing time. The power attending the last warning has what? Has enraged the wicked. Their anger is kindled against all who have received the message, and Satan will excite to still greater intensity the spirit of what? Of hatred and persecution. Are you following me? So does Ellen White have anything to say about the content of verses 44 and 45? She most certainly does. She does not use the terminology. She doesn't quote the verses. 
In our next session, we're going to see the reason why she doesn't quote the verses. There is a historical reason why Ellen White did not quote these verses. It would have caused a revolution in the church, and not a good revolution, a bad revolution. Because there was an individual, Uriah Smith, that was teaching that the king of the north was Turkey. And James White rebuked him. He said, no, that's not the Adventist view of the king of the north. And so if Ellen White had joined in the fray and had supported her husband, when Uriah Smith was the editor of the Review and Herald, it would have caused a conflict in the Adventist church. And Ellen White knew that at that time it was not crucial for people to understand this particular prophecy. But now it is. Because now we are living in that time. Just because it could not be understood fully back then, Ellen White, you know what Ellen White did? She says, you know, I'm going to write about this without quoting the verses and without using the language, and somebody sometime will discover what I had to say about it. <laughs> but I will not create a controversy or a conflict in the church unnecessarily now when there are more important things that we need to deal with. That teaches us an important lesson as well to us, you know, uh, w when it comes to issues that we face in the church today. So the last paragraph of this, um, right before um, the subtitle, The Beginning Point of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, the, thus the news from the north is identified in Revelation 18 as the loud cry of the angel who descends from heaven, that's the north, and the news from the east is the message concerning the seal of God in Revelation 7. This message from the north and the east that is described in Daniel 11.44a, that is the first part of the verse, fills the king of the north with fury to the point of wanting to destroy God's remnant as described in Daniel 11.44, the second half of the verse. Does this square with Revelation 13? Is the false prophet going to join the beast in proclaiming a death decree against God's people? Will this lead to a time of trouble such as never has been seen? Will the message concerning the sealing and the coming out of Babylon cause the rage? Will God's people be delivered from the time of trouble by the voice of God? Absolutely. And that's the best news of this whole thing, is that the king of the north will not have the last word. The last word will be spoken by none other than God himself. So let's be sure that we are on the right side. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.